recently I was rereading the book on Pope St. Pius V. It's a little book, and there's an, another thing on Pope St. Pius V, which is much more extensive. But it's fascinating because it really confirms our interpretation and our understanding of this issue, which is this, that Pope St. Pius V, prior to becoming Pope, as Cardinal Inquisitor, this is quoting from the book, page 45, Pope St. Pius V, when Cardinal Inquisitor Pius had granted certain English priests faculties for readmitting schismatics into the Catholic Church, the only condition then having been to refrain from reception of the Protestant Eucharist. You see that? Oh, that, yeah. So he was, Pius V was basically legislating on what, when people convert, what abjuration do they have to make? Or what do they have to profess to? What do they have to agree to? Do they have to agree to never, ever receive a sacrament from a priest who's compromised himself? No. He says that they have to refrain from receiving the Protestant Eucharist. In other words, receiving the invalid host. Now, what's interesting is, he goes on to say, in 1567, as Pope, he made the further more rigorous condition of non-attendance at Protestant services. Isn't that it? So he, he increased it. The, now, someone will say, wait a second, was he leaving it open for attendance at Protestant services before that? Yeah, that's what well, you could you could interpret well, he, that. He, well, here's the thing. He followed it up and said no afterwards. Well, well here's the difference, that... The Queen was imposing being present at Protestant services under pain of heavy fines, okay? So there, so there was actually a debate among certain people as to whether, in other words, like let's say someone had a gun to your head and said, unless you're, you know, you compromise and, or unless you come with me, I'm going to blow your head off. At what point would you have to say, blow my head off. Obviously, if he told you you have to worship a false god or deny an article of faith, but what could you go into the building and just stand there? Okay? I would say no. My, my, my opinion would be no. You could not go into the building. But some people said, well, you're not partaking, you're not participating in that. Okay, this, this, we can, this is sort of like passive attendance, and we can get into this about how it's not comparable to what people consider passive attendance today. But you see what I'm saying? Certain theologians were on both sides of this issue at the time. They were debating it. whether could, if, you're, if you're bound under pain of heavy burden, where's the absolute line drawn? Is, it's obviously drawn. You can never receive the invalid host. But if, if it's just like showing up at a building, do you have to not even step in the door, okay, and therefore, you know, face the heavy fines. My opinion would have been yes. Okay, but some people debated that, so Pius V, as Cardinal Inquisitor, obviously probably due to the confusion on this issue or some of the divergent opinions, he said he didn't, he didn't make that a requirement, okay, but later on as Pope he did. But you see what I'm saying? But oh, you, yeah, 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 yeah but it shows how differently they looked at it from what we are. But what it absolutely shows is that he did not never made it a requirement that you could never receive a sacrament from a priest himself who was implicated with the heretics. You, sure. You no, see no, the point? Follow, yeah. Well, you know what this actually proves even more now to me? It proves what you, we were talking about yesterday about dogmatic laws and ecclesiastical laws. Right. It even proves that point more. That's right. You know what I mean? I, I, that's my opinion. That's what I take out of it. That necessity... You're, you're, you're proving so, another point, too, and not even realizing it. That necessity makes illicit that which is illicit unless the faith is compromised. Okay? And so you can do things in necessity that you normally would not do because the salvation of souls is the supreme law. And so these... So, but I find this particularly devastating to the schismatics who uh, say that our position is heretical, the few who do. This totally proves it wrong. They would have to say that Pius V was sinning mortally by omission and basically uh, giving favor to heresy by not legislating that you could never receive sacraments from basically any priest in the realm, which he never did. Okay, and so it shows you how different his view on it. Now, one thing I want to point out is some people would say, well, that seems to favor passive attendance, which we've, see, we've pointed out, like, people during the um, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, this idea that you could passively attend non-Catholic services has been promoted. Um, so in, other that, words, in other words, I could go to a, a Baptist church as long as I don't participate in it or something. Yeah, for, for a friend's wedding 
or for some reason. Yeah, right, right. Okay, okay, that's uh, okay. And we were totally opposed to that. We've been quite outspoken on that because we we believe that's a compromise. Now, some people might say, well, what you're saying about what was legislated uh, when Pius V was Cardinal Inquisitor seems to favor that Pius of attendance is okay. And I would say, no, it's not comparable to what you're saying passive attendance is because in this case, the debate surrounded the issue of whether you were bound to avoid it because there were heavy fines and sanctions and great, great hardships involved. Right. Most people don't know. Most people don't know, and I didn't know, quite frankly, until last week um, when I watched the show about it. You have to understand what was going on at that time. Here's a queen that is forcing every single person in England. They're trying to bring the Protestant church back. They want everybody to be a Protestant, which was Catholic. So when you look at that situation there, that's a whole different situation. Exactly. Now, nobody's, nobody's forcing anybody, that's because we live in this liberal free-thinking, modernistic world where everybody can do whatever they want to do. Nobody, that's the problem. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? That's right. I mean, and everybody can do whatever they want. You can do whatever you think. You, you, do you think your purse makes you feel good? So at that time, the queen, like you said, was enforcing heavy fines on people. You must be Protestant or this or that. So yeah, so, so for people... points there. So for people to say that, well... Because there was some confusion as to whether people could be present at the Protestant services without sin, maybe some level of debate on that issue, that proves that I can go to my Baptist friend's wedding. No, sorry. Uh, those two situations are not comparable, and we believe it is definitely a compromise to go to those uh, non-Catholic funerals or weddings or services passively. And so, But I think this really devastates because Pius V, and actually I wanted to do a little audio thing on Pius V, just an incredible pope. I mean, how how rigorous he was in so many areas, and the things he would do, the laws he enacted against sodomites, adulterers. Uh, it was just, um, I mean, talk about a Catholic pope. And he himself, okay, is saying something that's perfectly in line with our position on this issue in which w these people who say it's heretical to even think you could go to one of these churches, they would have to say he's sinning mortally, at least by omission. And clearly, if you examine what he legislated in the context of what was going on, it clearly proves that he looked at it the same way we did. And it really proves, completely wrong, these people who said that our interpretation of this quote from Richardson, which I found, about how he's commenting on some people are receiving communion from these priests who are giving it to both parties, they're saying, well, he's not endorsing that. He clearly was, was not condemning those people who did that. So it really just proves how these schismatics are not Catholics and how our position is, is correct and balanced. Not that you have to go, but that in a necessity, in a, in a crisis, in a unique period, that things can be done which you know normally would not be. Sure, sure. So, but you were saying that when you saw the law, because you you had asked about jurisdiction and some people had been you know uh, confused about that. That when you saw that, for instance, the law in the past that monks were required to go to confession once a month, and that obviously that law is not binding any longer, or in this situation, that that really showed to you the difference between some of these matters. Well, yeah, very, uh, absolutely. I mean, it was it was almost kind of like um, you know, um, you know. Uh, well, what, what's the old saying? You, you, there's two things you can't teach a person: that's desire or common sense. Well, it was like common sense hit me right in the square in the eye because I didn't know anything about it. So, you know, common sense leads to that. If that was the case, then you would be in big trouble today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be in big, big trouble because you would be forced by, if you want to say, the people that want to argue um, that there's no jurisdiction for any priest right now on the planet, that you would argue that you're in mortal sin then because then you're, you're breaking a law that you must go to confession. Exactly. Once a month. I mean, and that, of course, that was for monks back then, but it, we have to also understand at that time that oh, monks were really only people that really were literate, they knew how to read, and they were, you know, they were religious. So, um, yeah, that's very, very, very um, profound, profound to understand that uh, ecclesi... In other words, I understand the difference between dogmatic law now and, and ecclesiastical law 
and um, won't be able to confuse them and, you know, say that an ecclesiastical law is a dogma. It's not. That's right. Not. I, I, don't, I didn't understand that before, but um, that, that, uh, that example and the example of um, um, using your crossbow, yeah. You know what I mean? And that there's another example. I mean, there's thousands. You know, there's, yeah, there's probably thousands of them that you can use. One of them would be a good example of um of, of what Pope Pius V um had there is that you know, as far as your attendance um oh, you know, if you were in a Protestant church or something at that time but you weren't participating or doing anything because you were forced to be in there. Well, would not would not constitute you to be sinning. Well, yeah, he didn't necessarily explicitly address that, but his his legislation as cardinal inquisitor simply said that you had to refrain from the Protestant Eucharist, and the reason it didn't say you must refrain from attend all attendance at Protestant services until he later became pope. Uh, was because there was some level of debate about that particular issue, and. And so what it really shows is, like, there's certain, there's a small number of radical schismatics out there who say that it's a mortal sin of omission and basically a failure to profess the faith to not get people, okay, when converting them today, to promise and profess that they'll never attend a mass of, you know, in union with Benedict XVI, or that they recognize all the people uh, who go to the masses where Benedict XVI is named as non-Catholics. They say that unless you do this, you, you know, failing to profess the faith, or it's an inadequate abjuration, or whatever they say, well, this proves them completely wrong, because Pope St. Pius V, in a situation which in many ways is comparable to our own, did not legislate any such thing for the re- admittance of schismatics into the church who had been compromised with heresies of this nature and false services of this nature. He simply said you must refrain from the Protestant Eucharist and then as Pope you must refrain from the Protestant Eucharist and attendance at Protestant services, which is exactly what we say. We say that you cannot go to the new Mass before you receive communion. You must obviously hold all the other teachings of the church and not compromise them. But other than that, uh, one doesn't have to make a positive statement about whether everyone at this particular church is lost and so forth. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, that is completely clear as a whistle. And then also uh, to follow up on your question, you asked me about the um, you know the jurisdictional part. Is I didn't really have any understanding of what ordinary jurisdiction compared to delegated jurisdiction meant, that which now I do understand. Because, I mean, it's for the simple fact is that if in a time of necessity or dire emergency, which would, which would be death, right. a priest at any given time can give you last, the last right. That's that in itself um, is profound. Well, yeah, as we were talking about yesterday, this uh, position that none of these priests have jurisdiction is, I have to say, about as stupid as traditionalist errors get. I mean, it, it demonstrates such a a failure to consider the history of the church, um, all of the different things which don't uh, line up with this position. It's really ridiculous. And so for those people, especially who have the chance to see their error pointed out to them, it really is ridiculous. And so it's something where that's why, like, even some of these people, we've we've made this information available to them, and they still assert the position. And you point out to them, like the Code of Canon Law says, that any priest in danger of death is granted jurisdiction automatically for confessions. Well, how does he get it? He gets it automatically. That proves that the way that jurisdiction is given okay, is a matter of ecclesiastical law and that the church can supply it automatically. So. Absolutely. And, in, and, in, and if we don't, I, I guess it, it would be a fair statement, wouldn't you say, that if we're not in a state of emergency now in the Catholic Church, well, I mean, I don't know what other state of emergency we could be in. Oh, well, yeah, this is the gravest crisis in all of history. Ever, yeah, and, and, ever. And that's why so many of these statements which people cite, even with regard to, um, you know, where to receive sacraments, 
are taken from periods which never envisioned this kind of scenario. They were talking about non-Catholic Protestant churches. Okay, they never envisioned a situation where the Catholic buildings would be taken over. In addition, okay, to the man in Rome, for decades and decades, and basically the whole apparent hierarchy, alleging to be Catholic but in fact was a pseudo-hierarchy, uh, it's totally unique from that standpoint. You, you just wonder what there, what a, what kind of a um, ecclesiastical laws would have been put into place for something along those lines. You know what I mean? But we'll never know. But it would just be curious, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. It's then see that's why people have to understand how you know our Lord looks at these things. I mean, like in the Gospels, like when the Pharisees denounced the apostles for picking corn on the Sabbath. And and he said, you know, did you not see what David did when he was on the run for King, from King Saul? When he was on the run, he went in and ate the loaves of proposition, which were forbidden you, to eat. He could not right. eat them, but he was on the run, and he was hungry, and he needed to do it. And so he ate them. Necessity made illicit that which is illicit. And so that's how our Lord looks at these things. It's something where... He values the most important things. The ecclesiastical laws are geared toward everything else. And so if they come to hinder that, then they're defeating their purpose. And so the faith is paramount. That can never be compromised. But it's not, okay, in approaching a priest whom you're not showing any agreement with, okay, even if he himself has compromised himself.